Okay, uh, Isabel, you were here last time. Uh, three of us weren't. Yes, you have a question? No, I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, and in the handout, we have uh, three main topics that are very important for Mamluk architecture in Cairo. Can you give us uh, a brief overview of the first one, the Qibla Street orientation? What's that about? Well, since they were building into an already um, existing urban space, in order to make sure that they have the proper Cuba direction, you would sometimes get sort of strange layouts as they were squeezing it into a street. But it was also so that passers by would actually like pass by, because so that they could possibly add to the means. Okay, well, uh, I mean, the, the important point is that the facades of the building were extremely important. And rather than have part of them recessed from the street to follow the Qibla direction, they made them parallel with the street. And that's a different direction from the Qibla. So you have areas of the building where they don't quite match up. And... Uh, that's what they're concerned with. Uh, now, uh, so Zainab, the second of the top, sorry? We don't have to just yet. We're not onto the slide just yet. Zainab, Sufis are the second topic on the list. What was important or interesting about those? Sufis. We talked about Sufis and Mamluk architecture. Just generally, what is going to be going on? You don't remember? Uh, let's see. Is it it's uh, Nada or Dana at the end? Dana. Dana. Dana sorry, Dana. Sufis. Yeah, khankas are buildings in which they lived, which were supported by the state. Sufis started off as uh, Islamic mystics who got together outside of state institutions, but by the Mamluk period, they became adopted by the state, and the Mamluk sultans themselves were very concerned with uh, patronage of institutions for Sufis. Uh, the last one is waqfs and waqf ahli. Isabel, that topic is roughly about what? Um, it's roughly about inheritance and how you can, um, since the Mamluks, like their period especially for, like there pretty much was no dynastic rule, like a very, like even if it passed from father to son. Well, there, there was dynastic rule, but it wasn't primogeniture. <laughs> it didn't follow uh, within the family necessarily, yeah, yeah. So because of that, in order to ensure that their descendants were taken care of, they would have walks, which were religious endowments, but they would have like their benefactors be their descendants. Yes, uh, and that applied not just to sultans, but to emirs, who of course didn't either have any hereditary right of succession to their office, uh, but they also became very wealthy, many of them, and wished to keep the wealth in the family. So this was one of the mechanisms by which they did it. And it possibly helps explain the enormous number of religious foundations in Cairo from this period. Uh, it's a way of keeping wealth within the family. So we were looking at Sultan Qalaun's complex and at the mausoleum in particular. Uh, it has an unusual ground plan of uh, an octagon within a square. And uh, I don't remember if we mentioned the origin of that uh, maggot. If you, any, if you remember any famous earlier Islamic buildings that have an octagon uh, within another uh, larger surrounding area. What's the first remaining Islamic monument? Hmm? No, not in Egypt, but in the, in the whole world. That is more or less in its original state. The earlier surviving example of Islamic architecture. 
The Dome of the Rock. Yeah. That's, Qalawun had spent a lot of time campaigning in uh, Syria. He had visited the Dome of the Rock and uh, it's possible that that was the uh, motivating factor behind the plan of this. It's not exactly the same, but it does have a central octagon supported alternately by piers and columns and uh, an ambulatory around it, a space that you can walk around it. Uh, and the central section of this, like the Dome of the Rock, has a dome over it. Uh, as you can see, it's very impressive in its ornamentation. It was actually his son, An Nasser Muhammad, who put the Mashrabeya screen around the tomb that was in the middle. And that, uh, actually, that's been extensively restored by the, uh, uh, by the Comité in the late 19th century. But it had some features which were very influential in the sense that later architects copied many of their features. And the mihrab here is one of them. So how does this differ from earlier mihrabs? Uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, Fatimid mihrabs from some buildings or Ibn Tulun, um, Isabel? It doesn't have any stucco on it. There's no stucco decoration on it, yeah? The s small columns. It has rows of small columns supporting little shell shapes between them. Now that's a new feature. Uh, what about the material, say, that's in between these? This is mosaic. It's a stone mosaic, in fact. And it's very finely detailed. So both of these features... Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, I just need to change the ratio here. It's squashed. We've moved from a regular classroom, so, so things aren't what they usually were. That's much better. Okay. Uh, and both of these features came from Syria. Uh, so, uh, Nada, any idea what you call this kind of feature, the way in which you have different stones for the arch of the mihrab made of different materials. What do you call the stones that make up an arch? Each of the stones is called what? Uh, is it juggling? This is juggling. Juggling of what? What do you call? Of the, no, the stones that make up the arch. The stones that make up an arch are the voussoirs. And when you fit them together like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, you're joggling them. They're joggled. Now, it's something that started in the Fatimid period. You can see it on Bab al-Fatou and Bab al-Nasr here in Cairo. There, it's very simple. Here... Yeah, I, I, I thought it started at the Mamluk. No, no, no. No, no, no. We have it much earlier. You can see it on the, on the lintels of Bab al Fatu and Bab al Nasser in the Fatimid period. Uh, but there, they're using limestone, all of the same kind. Here, it's made more obvious by having alternating white marble with either red or green slabs. And the pattern of the juggling, the, the jigsaw-like cut, is much more complicated now. It's a very decorative effect. And here, in fact, it probably is just decorative, even by this early time. It's probably just a thin veneer, a slice of marble in this pattern that's added onto a solid block of stone behind. So it's, it's more decorative than functional. So we're looking here up from one of the corners. Uh, the dome would be down here in the center. We have the flat roofs of the outer square to either side. 
but these are decorated. What's the technical term for this kind of decor? These are coffers, recessed elements in the roof. And what shape are the coffers? Yeah, octagonal. These are eight-sided octagonal coffers. And there are, in fact, many earlier ones in a series that lead up to this. There are a couple of major Ayyubid buildings that have them. The Mausoleum of Imam al-Shafi, uh, which uh, dates from the early 13th century, and the Salahaya complex. We talked a little bit about that in the last class because it's right opposite this, which in the main entrance underneath the minaret also has these octagonal coffers. And these have recently been restored, but I think they've actually done a, a very good job of uh, keeping the original patterns and colors to what they were. It gives us a good idea of the riches of the decoration of this kind of uh, part of the ensemble. So mostly arabesques, symmetrical vegetal compositions, but also with several epigraphic medallions, is what you would call those. So medallions, circular images with inscriptions running around them. OK, uh, this is a view that's taken from right beside the last monument. This is about a coke on the right hand side, yes, good. And this is the one that we're going to look at now, which is, it's the son of Qala'un and Nasr Muhammad. Although it's a building that actually was begun by a different sultan altogether. Uh, Ketboha is someone who was elected sultan or uh, because at the time Anasa Muhammad was just a young boy. So Kitboha took over the sultanate for a while. He proved to be unpopular, resigned, uh, and Anasa Muhammad came back again. And the madrasa that Kitboha had started, Anasa Muhammad finished. One uh, peculiar feature is the doorway that you see here. Uh, it's uh, Kirillus, yes. What uh, style is the doorway? Is it typical Islamic style, or is it, does it look different to you? It's not that it's smaller than any other kind. This is Gothic. Yeah, this is Gothic. This is a European style, which was actually transported from a Gothic cathedral that was built in Palestine. And it was in a town, Akka, that was conquered by the Mamluks, taken from the Crusaders who had built it originally. And one of the generals involved in that conquest brought it back to Cairo. There it sat for about five years when uh, the person who owned it died and his heirs sold it to Kitboha who was building this. Uh, and so he incorporated it as the, uh, the main entrance to his own complex. So it's an actual piece of Gothic architecture. It's, it's, uh, it's reused. Let's just have another look at the siting of this. The main buildings we talked about last week were the Salahaya complex built by the last Ayyubid Sultan in the middle of the 13th century. Then 1283 to 4, we have the Qala'un complex here. And now this building here is the madrasa and mausoleum of a Nasser Muhammad, right beside it. Uh, so 
Maggot, what, how would you describe the plan of this? 4 Iwan. It's a 4 Iwan building, exactly. You have a Kibli Iwan, a large one opposite, and two smaller side Iwans. Cells between them for the students. And you also have, what do you think this square building is here? Tomb. This is the tomb. This is the mausoleum. And it follows the street facade. And you can see, like the Qala'un one next to it, there's a little bit of uh, widening and thickening of the walls because the interior walls are all parallel or following the direction of the Qibla. Uh, the minaret over the entrance is a spectacular one. It has very dense stucco ornamentation. Here's a detail that shows you even better, I think, just how, uh, how many different patterns are filled together, uh, cramming the whole space with ornamentation. But this is a little bit unusual, in fact, in its density. Uh, also, we have a series of repeated arches with uh, polylobes on them, infilled with a geometric pattern. And there's another area of the Islamic world that we haven't done in this class yet that this closely resembles. Anybody know what sort of style is being copied here? Not Mughal, like Indian. not Indian, because they didn't use uh, stucco decoration, actually. They just used carved stone. But it's somewhere else where stucco was very popular as a type Fatimid of decoration. Fatimid hmm? period? Uh, well, the Fatimid period is, is an earlier period in Egypt when they did use lots of stucco. But I'm thinking of a contemporary period in a different part of the Islamic world. Hmm. Because that's where we have the the closest parallels for this kind of uh, dense work. It's the Maghrib in particular. Uh, when we look at buildings there, like the Alhambra in Spain, a little bit later than this, uh, we'll see very similar work. And it was in this time that the Christians were beginning the, the reconquest of Spain, taking areas uh, that previously had been in Muslim hands. And it's quite possible that some craftsmen uh, were out of a job suddenly and decided to try their luck in Cairo. There are a few other buildings from this period that uh, look very similar to the style that you find here. But a very different kind of stucco style is found particularly in the hood of the mihrab inside. Uh, Zainab, does this look familiar to anything that we've seen in this class before in stucco? We have large bulbous bosses which are actually hollow. It's purely a vegetal ornamentation, but uh, it's these large projecting three-dimensional uh, vegetal elements that make it very different from other stucco styles. Is there a, an earlier building we've looked at in this class, Zainab, that this reminds you of? I mean, this is the sort of comparison that I want you to be able to make. So, uh, uh, trying to link together different techniques, for instance, different styles of decoration uh, from different parts of the Islamic world is important. Anyone? Bulbous stucco elements, projecting examples. It's like the Ilkhanid work that we saw. Uh, remember the mihrab in the Friday Mosque of Isfahan made by Uljaitu? Had wonderful calligraphy, but it also had these three dimensional bosses, projecting elements. So, Cairo, unusually, is very receptive to outside influences. Yes? The Friday Mosque of Isfahan, the Great Mosque of Isfahan. 
uh, but it was in particular the mihrab that was added to it by Uljaitu in uh, just about the same period this was built, 1310. It's not that this copied that one, it's just that the, the same style was current in Iran at the time. And in fact, there are earlier uh, monuments in Iran which have this same kind of treatment. Okay, well, uh, the caption is sideways, but that helps fill the whole space of this building onto the page to make it larger. This is a building whose patron was another sultan who interrupted Anasar Muhammad's reign. Uh, this was built by Bebaz al Goshenkir, who had been an emir. Goshenkir means the, the taster, that was his job to make sure the sultan's food wasn't poisoned. But uh, again, Anasa Muhammad was still fairly young, a teenager now, when he took over in 1308 and built this in 1309. Uh, but he also made a mess of running the country and uh, was in fact killed. And Anasa Muhammad, who had been in exile, returned uh, to power for a very long time until 1341. So this, as the caption tells you, is a Khanka and Mausoleum, it's another complex. Now, which is the Qibla direction here? Is it uh, uh, Nada? Is it top, bottom, left, or right? right. <coughs> yes, how can you tell? We don't have a compass here, but there's a feature that you identified, presumably. So what was the clue that told you it would be the right? Or was it just a guess? <laughs> what, what feature would you look for? when you're trying to find a Qibla direction. What, what is a Qibla indicator? Yes. So where is the mihrab in this? Well, at the extreme right in this case. It's a, there's one here and there's one here as well. So there's one for the main prayer hall of the Khanka and for the mausoleum. Uh, so we have a, a building here. Yeah? Sorry, I have a question. Yeah? From, uh, from a plan point of view, mm -hmm. how can I differentiate between a khanka and a matas? You can't. You can't. Necessarily. Or between a khanka and a madrasa and a mosque. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, even the terminology that's used for the buildings, particularly in the 15th century, is totally mixed up. Uh, a, a contemporary chronicler will describe it as one thing, uh, as, a, as a madrasa, and the foundation inscription might describe it as a mosque. Or even the waqfaya might describe it as a mosque and the uh, inscription on the building as a madrasa. So it's not the form that will enable you to tell. Well, here in fact there is one element that would tell you that it's not a mosque. The, the rooms? The rooms, but they would apply equally, of course, to a madrasa or a khanka. They both have accommodation mm -hmm. for students. Uh, now, this has the, so this has a street. The main street is along here on the west of the building, taking the uh, Qibla roughly as east. Uh, although, in fact, the original street was, was back here and you can see just how much the building projected into the street originally by this amount. So this was a way of calling attention to it. And if we go back to the plan of the Bain al-Qasrain, well, the buildings we have just looked at, for instance, we have a big complex here. and. The mausoleum here, it's on the street and it's on the east side of the complex. 
that's in Akala Owens complex, the one in Anasa Muhammad. The mausoleum is on the street and it's on the east side of the complex. When we go to look at the plan of the Khanka, uh, we have the mausoleum is on the street, but it's on the west side of the complex. Why didn't they put it over here? Why didn't they have, say, the, the Khanka up this way and the mausoleum back here? You can't pray towards. You can't pray towards. You can't pray towards Mecca? Well, you can, yeah. if, you just, if you just sort of reverse the order. No, you can't pray towards a like, uh, person in a tomb. Mm. Some people might misunderstand. Well, <laughs> Sultan Hassan will, uh, <laughs> will confound that argument. At this point, I think that people knew where they were praying to, but like, is it because this street was more of a main street, yeah. or that street over there was more of like a backwards sort of thing? Uh, Nada? Did you say last time that usually uh, mausoleums have to be on the street so people can pass by and pray? Mm -hmm. mm. That's certainly one big advantage. But there are two reasons uh, why you pick a particular site for a mausoleum. One, uh, perhaps, is because it's on the street. Two, you want it to be near where people pray. And in fact, the people are praying mostly here, which is a long way away from it. Mm. But this perhaps tells you which is more important? Being on, the Being on the street, it seems. So uh, having this window here that faces onto the street so that people can stop and offer prayers for the founder is evidently more important for the sighting of this. Again, a little bit of difference between the street angle and the Qibla angle. Uh, but they've accommodated it by the different depths of the windows at this point. Is that the only dome? No, that's the only dome. What, what do these dots indicate here? Arches. Arches. This is the shape of the barrel vault that covers the Iwans. Although actually there's a little bit of difference here. Uh, these three entrances look as if they're going to be leading into rooms, but in fact they lead into small side Iwans. It's actually probably a holdover from an earlier type of domestic dwelling which had Iwans and uh, uh, a majlis, which was uh, a room that was divided into three parts with doors like this. This is a view of the mausoleum and the minaret. The mausoleum is plain on the outside, but the minaret has a rather a different shape now than the mostly square stories that we were used to. It has a lower square story, but then there's a complicated mokarnas cornice, uh, changing it into a circle, and then another small circular dome supported by many windows on the upper tier. So uh, this is one of the, the many variations and shapes that we're going to get in the Mamluk period of minarets. Now here's a detail of the main facade of the building, the one right on the street beside the, uh, on the outside of the mausoleum. And uh, Isabel, what's peculiar about this? Yeah, that's true. They're, they're using the arabesques just at the just turning so point so in the corners, yes, because it would be very hard to read there. <coughs> but is, is what's happened here? A name has been removed? Something has been removed. Okay. Now, uh, those of you who read Arabic well, the founder of this is Ruknadin Baybars. Mm -hmm. Is his name there? No. no? Look carefully. Rukun Adin Baybars. Baybars. Yeah, yeah, this is actually his name here Rukun Adin Baybars Al Mansuri. So 
His name is there. That's a surprise. Oh, okay. That's what you would think would be removed. But probably what was removed was the royal titles of Baybars. And it was probably removed by uh, Anasa Muhammad, who in fact closed down the uh, institution. Why didn't he remove his name? Well, presumably because it's a legal document. He was following Islamic law uh, since Baybars paid for the building and its endowment. He was still entitled to have that claim. But he, Anasa Muhammad, could at least insult him by taking away his uh, uh, royal titles. Why didn't he try to fill up the empty space with anything? I think perhaps just to call attention to the disgrace mm -hmm. of the name of uh, the founder. Mm -hmm. It was someone that he hated, somebody who had sent him off to exile. Mm -hmm. is, is that stone carving? This is limestone. This is all limestone, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one aspect of another building that Anasa Muhammad erected on the citadel, which was a mosque. Now, the citadel was, of course, the main residence of the Mamluk sultans in this period. Uh, he erected a mosque with two minarets. Kyrlos, what's, uh, what's unusual about the decoration of the minarets? You can see both of them here. They, in fact, faced different parts of the citadel, one towards the, the barracks, another towards the, the royal accommodation. Here's a, a detail of the, the further one. Oops. So what's remarkable about this? What, what type of decoration is it? What material? You don't know. Uh, tiles? Yeah, it's tiles. It's green, white, dark blue tiles, sometimes fitted just in, in single areas. But here, it's tile mosaic. And where have we had that technique before? in Iran. Well, in fact, there's uh, the report I think I mentioned briefly when we talked about the Ali Shah Mosque in Tabriz, where the Egyptian ambassador was there, and he was so impressed with the mosque that he took back its architect to Egypt. Uh, and according to the Egyptian histories, he had the architect design a minaret for his mosque that he built in the Delta. Uh, and then another emir, Qawsun, uh, borrowed him for his own mosque within Cairo. Now, that particular mosque has disappeared, but it seems that he founded uh, a, a school or a team of workers who decorated many monuments in time mosaic at the time. Lasted for about a generation, but then it died out. Uh, in fact, they the combination isn't used that frequently except in Anatolia. Uh, they preferred carving in stone for the main form of decoration or inlaid marble. But for a little while, this was popular, and it's very close to the Iranian examples that we've seen. OK, if a little bit later, if you were looking out over the city, in the days before it was uh, completely covered with smog, you would be able to see uh, what's the single most impressive Mamluk monument, which is the complex of Sultan Hassan. Uh, uh, a sultan who came to power also as a teenager wasn't responsible for many great military victories or economic expansion, but nevertheless, managed to build uh, this enormous complex, which obviously cost a tremendous amount of money. In fact, uh, Makrizi, our uh, most useful historian of Mamluk monuments, says that the, the cost of the scaffolding for the main iwan of this building alone would have been enough to build a small mosque. So 
that gives you an idea of the expenditures on it. Why did, or why was it possible, how is it possible for uh, Sultan Hassan to, to spend so much money in this? Yes, he did go into the public treasury, uh, but the public treasury at this time was swelled probably by uh, something you wouldn't think would be a positive factor, but there was a calamitous occurrence to the Black Plague, the Black Death happened just before this time. Yes, uh, whole families died. So instead of other members of the family inheriting their wealth, it all went to the state. So the state's coffers, the state's money available was much greater than it had been. Uh, and this is probably the result. This is the uh, 19th and early 20th century Rafai Mosque, which is in uh, Mamluk style, but it's not quite the original. Uh, so let's just have a look at the elements that make up the complex here. Uh, so, uh, Zainab, what are the, uh, what's the, the main area here around the courtyard? What type of structure is this? Okay, this feature, this is a, a hall that's closed on three sides and open in the fourth to a courtyard. What do you call that? Yes. So how many of them do you have around the courtyard? Okay, here's one. How many others do we have? Yeah, it's a 41 courtyard. And the wakfe of the building tells us that this was a jema. It was a congregational mosque. In addition to that, we have in the four corners of this, we also have a complex with an iwan, each one has an iwan facing the Qibla, plus rooms for students. So these are the four madrasas for the different four main legal rights. So there are four madrasas plus a congregational mosque, plus in the very place you wouldn't expect it as you were saying, a tomb behind the Qibla Iwan. So we've got the best of both worlds here. We have a street, in fact it's a whole maidan, surrounding it on three sides, lots of space for passers-by to stop and offer prayers, and you get a reminder of the prayers of the people in the Qibla Iwan. He wasn't buried there, right? Uh, he ended up, you're quite right, he ended up uh, <laughs> being killed and his body is in an unknown location. This is what happens when you build your, you know, tomb out of blood money and death. That's right. Serves him right. <laughs> <laughs> Poetic <laughs> justice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, another interesting feature about it is the main entrance, which is down here. And it's, there is a street out here, but it's tilted a little bit. Uh, Dana, any idea why you would want to have it at a different angle? Why would the architect pick? Nada? Anyone? Yeah? So that people would see? Yeah, so that it would be more visible, particularly from yes. this is the main Maidan, and the citadel is up here further to the left. So from this viewpoint, it's more visible. All of this area is highly decorated. Yeah. It's yes, it is very highly decorated. All of that area has uh, behind it has been recently restored. We're not sure what it was like originally. Uh, there was also at a at a later stage possibly a bazaar or souk that was constructed beside it, and there was a water wheel here which provided water for the institution. Oh, this was not, not, no, not quite covered it. No, you can still see uh, the tops of it, but certainly the street level, especially in this side, has risen very considerably. Yeah, that's typical. 
So here's the view from the Maidan in front of the Citadel. And you can see here what a difference it makes having the main entrance tilted so that you can see it much better. Uh, we also have these features on the outside. What do you think caused this damage? Cannonballs. Cannonballs. We were talking about another building which had a colossal Iwan and had cannonball marks on it. Do you remember that one? This is the type of comparison that you might get in slide tests, so it's useful to... Uh, it, was, it was used as a citadel at one stage, but it was actually built as a mosque. Oh, wait, it was that thing that... Oh, it's filled with grass. <laughs> uh, no, we're not grass at the moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. It's another building that was enormous, that was built as a mosque, fell into disrepair, mm -hmm. and they discovered it made a rather good citadel, in fact. And so that's why it has cannonball marks on it. It's, it's the Mosque of Ali Shah, the one that had the Iwan even bigger than Taki Kisra. Uh, now here, when Mamluks were rebelling against the ruling sultan, they discovered that if they dragged cannons up onto the roof, it made a great platform to bombard the, the stables of the citadel, which were just opposite. And naturally enough, the Mamluks in the citadel retaliated. But fortunately, the building is so tough and so solid, didn't make that much of an impression. Here's a view from one of the sides. Any, uh, anyone heard of Lewis Sullivan, the architect? Any fans of early modern architecture? He was one of the first builders of skyscrapers in Chicago. And the kind of parallel window recesses that you have here appear in those buildings in the West for the first time there. And it's been thought he might even have been copying something like this. It's remarkably modern in its appearance, actually. Uh, so possible connection, but we're not quite sure about that. The portal is the single most impressive one in Cairo. And it has some interesting features about it. There are parts of it that aren't quite symmetrical. Tell me, have a look at it and see if you can figure out which parts aren't symmetrical. in terms of the decoration, that is. It's, it's, it's not complete yet. Or it's not complete, yes. What, what evidence do you have for that? The top part. OK, you have, for instance, a little rectangle here that isn't marked out on the right-hand side. Anything else that indicates it's not complete? Yeah? You don't find the left column? This one? Yeah, it's not on the other side. It's in the shade. It's actually there. <laughs> yeah. Only one of like the little recesses are actually like filled in with decoration while the other ones are left blank. You mean this I yeah. mean like that square. This one? That, square that one. Yeah, it, they they may well have intended other types of decoration in these, which isn't there. Uh, but here's another indication. You have a kind of interlace ribbon that was started at the bottom, but then stops. And you have it on both sides at the beginning, but it obviously was intended to go all the way up, but never finished. So again, Sultan Hassan was, it was a very precarious life being a Sultan in the Mamluk period. You never knew when, if you did a bad job, the other emirs would gang up against you and assassinate you. That's what happened to Sultan Hassan. So because of this, his building was never finished. And we'll see, uh, we'll talk about that more when we visit the building. 
This is the original entrance door to his complex. It's the single most impressive uh, metal revetted door we have in Cairo. Anyone know where it is? Islamic Museum. No. Hmm. It's on the mosque and tomb complex of Al Mu'ayyid, which is right behind Bab Zawela. Uh, he in inverted commas, bought the door. Obviously, well not obviously, but in fact the price he paid for it was almost certainly much less than it was worth. Uh, he liked it so much and used it on his own complex, but at least it's been preserved. Although it's only in the last 20 years that one of the knockers and the bottom inscription have been uh, stolen, sadly. Uh, but it's a an extremely impressive example. I mean, the knocker is more or less decorative. It's actually above, uh, above most people's height to be able to reach it even. Uh, but this kind of radiating star pattern, it's one that you find in many different media in the Mamluk period, including uh, uh, Koran covers and mimbars, for instance. And being the biggest complex in Cairo, it also has many of the biggest individual features like Iwans. Uh, now there's also a report from an, an historian that Sultan Hassan ordered his Iwan to be bigger than the Taki Kisra. And the historian notes that it was built five cubits higher and wider than it. In fact, it's not. But the Taki Kisra was in Mongol territory at the time, so they didn't know any better. The fact that he thought it was bigger, that was okay. But it is still extremely impressive, as you can see. And it also has some fabulous decoration. Even more complicated, what do you call these again? Juggled voussoirs for the arch over the mihrab, lots of inlaid marble on the Qibla wall, and a very interesting Quranic inscription here, which is in what type of script? This is Kufic, yeah. This is a constant bass line. Very decorative one that appears in contemporary Qurans, and it's interesting that the uh, the person who signed the calligraphy in one of the courtyards was in fact uh, an emir who was responsible for overseeing the work. But we know that he also signed a uh, Quran. He was actually a, uh, a very capable calligrapher. So it's quite possible that he was the one who designed the main inscriptions for the building. Yeah, Isabel. Probably not. I don't. They didn't normally uh, paint the roofs of buildings. Now that's not always the case in in the Barakouk complex, which we'll see when we visit the Ben Al Khasrain a week from Friday. There is one roof that has a uh, uh, kind of reciprocal pattern painted on it, but that's exceptional. So normally, I don't think so. Uh, there was lots of other distractions. The the lamps that you see here are modern but we have many of the original lamps from this building on display in the Museum of Islamic Art. And they are fabulous examples of uh, the art of glasswork with enamel painting on top of them in different colors, red, green, yellow, blue. Uh, many inscriptions on them, but they also have vegetal decoration. What kind of uh, style is this in? Here's a particular plant that, yeah, this is a Chinese lotus. So, is it the only plant? <laughs> it's not the only plant, but it's a distinctive one. I mean, there's another. This is. Uh, is this one famous for anything? No, it looks to me just like an abstract uh, plant, not really based on any any real one. But after the piece that the uh, 
Mamluk Emir negotiated with the Mongols, we start finding Chinese lotuses appearing on decoration in, uh, in metalwork and on buildings. So it's likely, it seems, that Chinese objects started flooding into, uh, into Egypt. Trade restrictions were relaxed, and so uh, we get local artisans copying the Chinese style. And just an example of the riches is the, uh, the door to the mausoleum from the Kibli Iwan, which has wonderful gold and silver inlay. Uh, this is one of the finest examples. And here, too, we'll see that when we, <coughs> when we visit it. Excuse me. We'll see some uh, Chinese lotuses in the designs. Here's part of the gold inlay that uh, has the name of the sultan. OK, we're going to move from this, the old city to an area that was, at the time, it was built fairly remote. Uh, this, OK, the caption is just below the screen here, the complex of Farag ibn Bar'u in the northern cemetery, 1400 to 11. Took a long time to build. Uh, OK, 1400 to 11. We have looked at some other buildings in the Islamic world from the same period. Who was uh, active as a patron around 1400? That, that we have seen in earlier classes. Timur, Tamerlane. And did he have any contact with Egypt? Yes. What sort of contact? Yeah, he never made it to Cairo, or not actually into Egypt, but he made it into Mamluk territory and uh, took off lots of the artisans. Uh, he besieged Aleppo and Damascus, took lots of booty back with him, so it was disastrous for the Mamluk economy. So uh, he came in about oh, 1402 or so, so uh, uh, it's not surprising that this took so long. It was a, a very difficult time for the Mamluks. Uh, Kyrilos, what sort of elements do you think we have here? What sort of functions in this multifunctional complex do we have? Well, 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 it looks like a madrasa, but it's actually a chanka. So as we said, it's, it's very hard to tell them apart, but this is a chanka, mostly. Uh, so the cells for the Sufis are here on one side. Surrounding the courtyard, however, we have prayer halls that unusually are covered with brick vaulted roofs. What would the usual be at this stage? What type of roof? Hmm? A wooden roof, a flat wooden roof. If it's not an Iwan, you would expect a flat wooden roof. It's been suggested that perhaps the uh, embargo on, uh, or not an embargo, but at least the difficulty of importing wood from outside because of the poor economic situation might have uh, caused it to be made of, of uh, brick instead. Two large circles indicating tombs. And here in this area, there were small Iwans, which it seems were uh, accommodation for the family of the founder when they went to visit the complex. Okay, uh, there are more elements of this I want to I want to look at, but what I want to do before just looking at a few of them is to start giving you some practice for the exams that are coming up. We're going to have uh, slide tests where you have where you have individual slides and where you have comparisons. The comparisons are particularly important. And I want you to organize it uh, in this way. For individual slides, you need the, the name 
the date, the patron, the location. On your syllabus, you have all of this laid out in one page, showing you what is expected. OK, but for comparisons, you're going to put left and right, dividing the page in this basic information, name, date, patron, location. And then you're going to give me the similarities. You want to divide the page again and give me the differences. OK? This is for, there's going to be, in a comparison, a slide on the left-hand side and a different one on the right-hand side. So you're going to give me the identification, name, date, patron, location of the left one here, name, date, patron, location of the right one here. Then the similarities, then the differences. OK, there are only th six of you at the moment in the class. You'll be on your own in the, in the slide test, but for this exercise, just, uh, Isabel, you come over here, and the one in the middle can write down the suggestions of the other two. You can work together. You can consult in this, OK? So here's the first example, OK? You have two monuments. Uh, I hate to disappoint you, but in the, in the actual slide test, you probably won't have the captions. <laughs> so the, the, the date and the patron, uh, they're already given. So don't worry about that. So start off, start off uh, looking at the uh, similarities and differences. Just want one, sheet of paper for one sheet of paper. I'm not going to take this from you. This is not a test. This is practice. But please write them down, so because I'm going to ask you in a few minutes what results you have. Okay, so just one person can write; the others can consult. Actually, uh, I I, uh, I should have I should have mentioned that. Let Let me just talk about something here that I I should have mentioned before, which is that since this is built in the desert, it's not street aligned. Everything is square. square. It's parallel with the Qibla. And just something else that I should have mentioned as well is the location of the mausoleum within the whole complex. Um, it's along the Qibla wall. It's along the Qibla wall. Yeah. So there wasn't a major street here. So uh, that meant it could be in the other most advantageous position, which is beside the Qibla wall. Okay. When you're comparing plans, you're going to be comparing the elements that are most obvious from the plans. You're not going to talk about decoration, for instance. What you have found so far. So, first of all, give me some similarities over here. Yeah. Uh, they both have the cubicles on the left and right. Mm -hmm. They both have cells for students, yes. Uh, in fact, it's not actually quite clear that these are cells for students. This is more an ablutions area, I think but uh, the original arrangement of this has been lost. But uh, yes, the, these little rooms could have been also for students as well. That's mm -hmm. possible. OK, sales for students, yes. Uh, the is in the same place. What do you mean the mehrab is in the same place? Well, I mean, you're going to have a mihrab in the middle of the Qibla wall, usually. True, but like, there are two mihrabs here. That Same orientation. Well, they're Qibla oriented. Yeah. The mihrabs are always Qibla oriented. That's not, that's not a similarity. That's, yeah. that's taken for granted. <laughs> that wouldn't be worth mentioning. Uh, OK, any other similarities? Well, they both have mausoleums, yes. I mean, uh, they both have chankas and mausoleums. Um, uh, they both have bent entrances? They both have bent entrances, yes. So yeah, on the left? Oh, this is the entrance here. Uh, and it, you can either go from here into the, from the vestibule into the tomb, like this, or through this corridor into the chanka. Oh, I guess 
also got some other similarity too. Like it looks like the tombs have their own entrances. The tombs, well, uh, this one has its own entrance, but in this case, actually, the entrance is from the the Qibla oh. prayer area. It's from here okay, so or from here. Like the These are just windows. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not quite obvious from the plan, I agree. Both incorporate a courtyard? Like both, both have uh, spaces organized around a courtyard, yes. So what about differences? This one is not a 4E1. Okay, 4E1 plan versus uh, hypostyle yeah. prayer halls. Uh, flat roof versus vaulted roofs. Yeah, that's not really that important. I mean, it's it's true, sure, but uh, <laughs> it, it's it's not something I think that the architect was planning from the beginning. <laughs> but uh, it it is interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Especially that one because it's randomly in the corner. This one. No, that this? one makes more sense to me than where that is. Uh, yeah, there's actually two here because um, this one is for the male members of the family, this one for the female members of the family. They separated them in that way. There's columns here, there's no columns Well, there. hypostyle versus EYN. If you've said hypostyle versus EYN, you wouldn't need to, to add to that. Uh, something else, please, that I, that I forgot to mention when I was talking about this. Yeah, street alignment, that's very important. That's very important here. The fact that it was built in the desert meant they didn't have to worry about street alignment anymore. And that also meant that the location of the mausoleum could be next to the Qibla wall. Whether in this case it's opposite the Qibla wall. So those are important points to, to compare. Uh, something I didn't point out is that this space and this space were actually a new feature in a building that uh, comes about this time, a Sabil uh, Maktab. Anybody know what a Sabil Maktab is? Uh, elementary school? A Maktab is an elementary school, school for oh, orphans to learn the Quran. And the Sabil is the water dispensary, exactly. So that becomes a standard feature of later architecture. Okay. Uh, we'll have to stop there today and we'll carry on and finish Mamluk architecture in the next class and then go on to Mamluk decorative arts.